To all who are new here, welcome to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our upcoming schedule, so check back often. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the VOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and evaluation. This email will come from customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done in order to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive the follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. We have fixed a couple bugs we had with our statements of credit, so these should all be correct and available for you to download from our website. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you find a discrepancy. If you have any questions during this webinar, please submit the question and we will review questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left or to the right and the slides will become visible. There is a handout which includes today's PowerPoint that's available uh, for download from the dashboard. The recording will also be available for review from our website tomorrow. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Eli Friedman, who is the Medical Director of Sports Cardiology at Baptist Health, and he works as a clinical and sports cardiologist. He completed his undergraduate degree at Brown University in the University of Pittsburgh, medical school at Ross University and the Chicago Medical School Rosalind Franklin University, and his residency and fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He serves as a team cardiologist for Broward College, Nova Southeastern University, Florida Medical University, and he serves as an advisory sports cardiologist for Broward County Public Schools. He works with the Heart of a Champion, which is a partnership with One Beat CPR and AED and the American Heart Association to teach how to recognize and respond to cardiac arrest in a sports setting. In his college years, he played as a pitcher and considered going into Major League Baseball as a free agent prior to pursuing medical school. He will be speaking today about the cardiovascular care of the athlete. And I'll let him take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Henny. I, I really, really appreciate it. I, I want to congratulate you and your team on, on everything you've put together here. I, I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that uh, education and uh, learning has been accessible to people where it wasn't before. So it, it's really an honor to be a part of this. And my, my goal today is to uh, do this with sort of in a storytelling format and also to do this with as much equipoise as possible. We're definitely going to touch on COVID quite a bit. Uh, because that's been in the headlines and it's sort of been taking up all of our time in the sports cardiology world and again i want to do that with as much equipoise as possible so um, i appreciate everyone coming to this and, and look forward to sharing some of the information I have no disclosures relevant to this talk i always like to start things out with the case just to get us in the right frame of mind and what we're dealing with so that this was a, a young man that i saw 18 years of age who was a very high level division one football he was sent to us evaluation because there's a family history of heart disease. His grandmother had a defibrillator, um, which we'll touch on what that is a little bit in a little bit, but no one was really sure why she had it, but it did raise some concern with his uh, pediatrician that he was sent to us, but he was doing quite well. He was asymptomatic. Um, we always touch on their social history, so he does no drugs, no funny stuff at all that was concerning, and his exam was completely normal. But when you come to see me, uh, we, we usually get an ECG. I understand uh, those of you in the audience may not be familiar with looking at this, but to me, when I see this ECG, this is grossly abnormal, and hopefully you can see my mouse, um, these things called T are down pretty much everywhere throughout his ECG, which when we see that in the sports cardiology world, it definitely raises our concern for, for underlying diseases. So now that I've told you that the ECG is abnormal, I need you to play with this abnormal. him to play without restrictions or Testing, would he be able to play for now, but would you obtain further testing in the interim? Would you not clear him and, and then obtain testing and make a decision on whether he was in the field or not, just based on that ECG alone? I can tell you what we did is we did not clear him. We got further testing. 
generalities in the ECG. So here are the objectives that hopefully we can touch on today. I definitely want to introduce to you the, the concept of cardiologists. There's a key concept that we all need to understand called exercise-induced cardiac remodeling, which is always important as part of testing, especially in ECG screening and the controversies that that can lend. Um, I, I underline the attempt to understand the implications of COVID because every single day it seems like we get more information and we change how we're doing things. Hopefully we can at least provide some clarity to everyone on that. And then probably the thing that I'm most passionate about is sudden cardiac death, sudden cardiac arrest, and emergency action planning. So what is a sports cardiologist? A sports cardiologist is a cardiologist who, is, who provides cardiac care to professional amateur sanctioned, highly competitive, or very, very active individuals. And fortunately, this is a growing population, and it's fortunate because we know the benefits of across the spectrum of any disease, let alone cardiovascular disease. And in my practice, we will see anybody in their early teens all the way up to their 70s and 80s, and we've even seen 90-year-olds and even 100-year-olds who continue to exercise because of the benefits of it. They're a different group than the general cardiac population. They have different needs. They have different testing. Um, their treatments can sometimes be different as well. If you interact with athletes, we, we can certainly understand their needs because athletes are just a different population and, and different um, different personalities than maybe other folks. It, it really is becoming a necessity at the professional and amateur levels. And we always encourage people who want to go into this field not to forget about dancers or the tactical occupational athletes like first responders, police officers, EMS, etc. This illustration really shows where, where we see ourselves at in all of this. Traditionally, um, it was simply the athletic trainer, the athlete, the coaches, and then uh, this primary care sports medicine physician or primary care physician. And cardiologists were involved, but sometimes it was later on in the game, once an athlete had established disease or after something really terrible had happened. Um, increasingly now, we are being called in at the beginning of all of this within the pre-participation exam and really being viewed as an active cardiologist and not just an athlete which from our side we find is beneficial because we're able to introduce ourselves to the athletes and really play a vital role in their health, not just during their athletic career, potentially afterwards as well. If we look at the sort of the core competencies as Aaron Bagish and his colleagues just wonderfully outlined for us in the team and the document we put together regarding core competencies in sports cardiology, they're really four fundamentals that you have to be consistent with and have to be um, fluent with in order to be a sports cardiologist. That includes the understanding of what exercise-induced cardiac remodeling is and how to differentiate that from pathology, which we'll touch on. You have to be able to evaluate a symptomatic athlete. You definitely need to be able to manage an athlete who has disease and who wants to continue to perform at high levels. And then we play a very large role in screening as well when we're invited into that. I show you this slide just to reinforce the point that more and more people are turning to sport. And this is NCAA data. On the far left is uh, in 1983, and on the far right is 2018-2019. You can see that this is increasing, and really across the board, more and more people are turning to exercise. So that, that's a good thing. Unfortunately, I suspect the financial implications of COVID, we will see a downturn in death, that there will be less athletics and less athletes being able to get into high school and get cancer. Um, but more and more people are turning to sport, and more and more they are doing it at high levels, which means there's more and more for us to the quotes that you'll see are real. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I've heard it multiple times from different folks, which is an elite athlete being evaluated by a regular cardiologist is like taking a Lamborghini to a Chevy dealership. Sure, they'll try to fix it, but they don't know what the blank they're doing. And that, that's not a comment on our general cardiology colleagues who don't interact with athletes much. I think this speaks more to the mindset of highly competitive athletes and the personalities that they have and the needs that they have and being able to meet those needs and have and this takes us into this whole concept of exercise-induced cardiac remodeling. Now, I show you this picture just to illustrate the point of the heart is a muscle. So on the left, you see the heart, the ventricles, the ventricles at the bottom of the screen, the coronary arteries. And on the right, I show you a biceps muscle and a triceps muscle. Just to illustrate the point that you see striated muscle in both. You, you see muscle that is able to attend. When an athlete comes into our clinic, the, the first and most important thing that I need to do is understand what sport the athlete participates in because what sport the athlete participates in will then dictate how their heart and muscle change and adapt to the sport that they're playing. So to go through this slide, on the bottom on the x-axis we have a dynamic component and on the left on the y-axis we have a static component. So when I 
aerobic or aerobic exercise. I think so in any athlete in resting conditions, cardiac output can be four to six liters per minute, which is normal. But as somebody participates in cross country running or cycling, that cardiac output can increase to 20 to 30, even beyond liters of cardiac output per minute. So you really have large volumes of blood coming back to the heart over and over. And for years and years of training and activity, that can change how the heart works. I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. On the left, in the static component or the isometric component, you can also think of this as a pressure challenge for the heart. In that, let's say we take a power lifter who's you know, deadlifting 500 or more pounds, the systemic blood pressure, systolic, can go to 250, even 300 millimeters of mercury. And doing that over and over again causes changes to the heart as well. If you look in the top right of the screen, you can see the sports that really interplay with both of those, things like cycling, decathlon, rowing. These are incredible dynamic and static components of the heart that, again, will change how the heart looks. And this is the slide that illustrates that. So if we go to the left first, under normal resting conditions, you have a left and a right ventricle. But in some people eating in high endurance training for years or years or volume heart, you can see what's called hypertrophy, where the cavity of the heart in the wall and the muscle work well. And you can see the same thing in the right, the right ventricle, the right chamber of the heart. You should never have Dr. Friedman? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are having a little bit of difficulty with the audio. It sounds like um, it is there, but then it seems to kind of uh, come fade and fade and come back in. I will move it a little bit closer and tell me if that's making okay. it any better, okay? And if it's not, let me know and I can change to a headphone and we can make that better. So um, just so we make sure that uh, we all hear that on the left on the, the volume component, we can see that with repetitive volume challenges to the heart, we can have an enlargement of the left ventricular cavity as well as the walls, some mild thickening. And that could has to happen, that can happen in both the right and left ventricular cavities. You will never want to see right ventricular enlargement without concurrent left ventricular enlargement. On the right side of the screen in the strength training or the pressure component, you will sometimes see enlargement of the left ventricle of the heart, the not the ventricle, the walls of the heart without necessarily enlargement of the chamber or the, the left ventricular cavity. There really isn't much in right ventricular chamber. And, and so just to illustrate that point a little bit more, the heart will adapt to what you do. So if I take an Alabama offensive lineman, I would expect his heart to somewhat look like that, in that the heart muscle will get a little bit thicker. Versus if you have a cross country athlete, I would not expect a thick left ventricle as much as I in the chamber. This just illustrates the point that the, the ventricles of the heart, the heart is a muscle and it will adapt and that you expose it to. So when we get into evaluating our student athletes, that component of exercise induced cardiac modeling is very important because it helps us to illustrate exactly what's going on with the, the PPE. So there's a history, there's a physical exam. You can also use an ECG or an EKG and sometimes an echocardiogram as well. The PPE is very important because it's an opportunity to introduce the student athlete to the medical team. We can educate our student athletes on the importance of the PPE, the importance of the healthcare team and the members of it. And we can identify the conditions that could expose the athlete to problems, especially cardiovascular during his or her sport. And, and what we do from the heart perspective, the cardiovascular perspective, is what's called the American Heart Association 14 point screen or the PPE4. I show that to you here. There's 14 components that include a personal history, a family history, as well as a physical examination. Things that we ask in the personal history are exertional chest pain or discomfort, unexplained passing out, syncope or near passing out, unexplained or disproportionate shortness of breath. Has anyone had a heart murmur before or elevated blood pressures? Or have they ever been restricted from sport for testing as a result of their, their prior restriction? You see the family history there. We ask those questions quite often. Things that I put in there are, has anybody in your family drowned or has anybody had an unexplained motor vehicle accident? These are really important things that we talk about. And then of course, we also wanna know about recreational performance enhancing drug use or any substances that they might be using. So the, the PPE is good, but if you look at the data, 24 to 43% of athletes will answer positive for one question in their personal or their family history. 
which could lead to further testing. But it's really important to then go over it with the student athlete because it could be a false positive. And you need to ask yourself, are the symptoms really concerning cardiac symptoms? What exactly is that history? And there can be a lot of misinformation, sometimes information from their family members that aren't entirely true. And it does take some time to do that. One component that we often add into our PPEs are ECG. Um, there's no US guideline at this point in time which mandates that an ECG is necessary. It's actually specifically not recommended for routine use by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. But if you sit down with the stakeholders and who you're doing the PPE with, it can be used as a, a very valuable tool. If you look at this consensus statement, out by the NCAA in 2016, along with colleagues in the sports world, it does get into ECG screening. And what it talks about is, is sort of three things that are very important. And I, I underline uh, several of them, but I think we should go through this, which is number one, you want to meet to discuss the execution of the ECG screening. And you want to make sure that the person who's going to interpret it actually knows the criteria and what they're looking for. And when people approach us about incorporating an ECG, we often set aside about two hours really in-depth discussion. We need to make sure that the student athletes are involved, as you see below, that student athletes should be provided the information and they should have a, a voice in, in the discussion. And then we need to make sure that the downstream testing can be done efficiently and, and can be interpreted by people, again, who are familiar with the concept of, of testing in athletes. And sometimes you wanna do this in specific groups of student athletes versus student athletes as a whole. And we'll touch on that data in a bit as well. And we want to make sure that everybody is on board and everybody is on the same team when it comes to it. If we go overseas, though, we find that our European colleagues and the International Olympic Committee both mandate ECGs for all of them. And a lot of it comes from this data, which comes out of the Veneto region of Italy. This is a busy slide, and I'll take you through it. In 1979, 1980, 1981, 1982, there was a spike in this Veneto region in sudden cardiac death. It got upwards of four per 100,000. At that point in time, an Italian sport law was put into place in which an ECG had to be done on every single student athlete. And it was done by specific sports cardiologists. And if an athlete received a clearance and then went on to have a cardiovascular issue, that, that physician could lose his or her license. And what you can see is that sudden death rate then went down uh, precipitously and, and has stayed down up until this data was compiled. This was tried to be replicated in Minnesota. And you see that there was no significant change. In Israel, in 1995-1996, there was a large spike in the sudden, sudden death rate. And in 1997-1998, their law was put into place. And, and you see that the rate went down. But if you look prior to all of this data, you will find that the, the rate was never necessarily high before. And what the Israelis in this study argued were twofold. Number one, that these things can happen in clusters. But number two, during this time in Israel, in 95-96 and 97-98, this was one of the hottest years on record in Israel. So they wondered whether or not heat illness was more responsible and did the ECG play any role in reducing the death at all. So again, lots to think about and lots to unravel. Again, Dr. Aaron Bagish and his colleagues through Harvard did a study looking at ECGs in athletes. They took 508 athletes and obtained an echocardiogram in every single one of those athletes as the gold standard of cardiology. And then they compared the history and physical alone for those athletes versus history and physical plus ECG. And, and the results were, were quite interesting. There were three athletes at the end of those 508 who had findings that were relevant to sports or strength. And if you look at them, in the medical history and physical exam alone, only one of them had a finding, which was a murder. The, the athlete who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and myocarditis had no findings in the history and physical exam that would have led to those conditions being diagnosed. However, if you added in the ECG to the history and physical, now you identified all of those athletes. So the ECG did add something in this group. And if we look at not things called sensitivity or specificity, the physical exam and history alone only identified five of the 11 athletes who had relevant findings. And the, the sensitivity was quite low, but the specificity was high. The false positive rate was low. But then if you put in the physical exam, history, and the ECG, now you identified 10 of the 11 athletes with pathology. You identified all three who then needed to be restricted. So the sensitivity went up significantly, but it did come at a rate of false positive. So again, there were 11 athletes in total who had findings that were worrisome, but only three who needed to be restricted. So the ECG is really helpful at helping find the abnormals, but it can increase the false positive. 
This was based on prior ECG criteria, though. And that, that criteria has been refined. Where again, there was an international consensus for ECG findings. Where we sit today, th this is the criteria we use. It, it's a very busy slide, and we won't go through all of it. But essentially, you have normal findings for athletes, you have borderline findings, and you have grossly abnormal findings. You're, an athlete is entitled to any one, any number of these normal findings, only one of the borderline findings and none of the abnormal findings. If you find two or more borderline findings, then further evaluation is recommended. When Dr. Bagish's athletes were, were tested with this criteria, uh, the false positive rate went down significantly and the specificity raised. So this is the criteria with which you use today. And th this is my second who's a colleague in Australia, a sports cardiologist. He states that I've come to the conclusion that the ECG is an underestimated tool by the general cardiology fraternity, but overestimated amongst athlete screening enthusiasts. I treat changes with respect, but not fear. So we have to have, um, at this point, we have to be thoughtful when we see these ECGs. And again, we, we have to make sure everyone is on board and on the same page. So the the item that I imagine is on most everybody's mind right now and what we're all hearing about is coronavirus. And, and I hope for everybody listening today and, and in the future, this has not touched your family, that everyone is safe and healthy and well. I think for those of us who are sports cardiologists, I don't think any of us could have imagined the tidal wave that was coming with this. And a lot of us are all COVID all the time. Dr. Henny and I were talking and every single day, articles are being sent to us primary care sports medicine physicians are calling us and we're all trying to figure out the best way to deal with our athletes in this setting. So again, I hope everyone's safe, but I want to try to present where we are at right now and, and give you a sense for how we're doing. So I, I do want to give you a case. This is not a student athlete per se, but we, we have seen our first responders go down with this at a, at a high clip and it, it's been significant. So to give you an idea of what we're seeing, here is a 33-year-old male fighter fighter who was sent to us who was very healthy. He was COVID positive about four weeks prior to his operation. He did test negative twice in order to return to work. He had mild symptoms during the test. He did not require hospitalization. He was a recreational exerciser, but he did it at a high level. He ran, he biked several times per week. He incorporated weightlifting as well. And we're, when we're talking runs and cycling, we're talking 15 to 20 miles on the bike in three to five mile runs. He was never hospitalized, as I mentioned, but he noticed that he wasn't recovering the way in which he wanted to. He's noticing that his heart rate jumped with any activity and he really felt disproportionately depressed. So the question that came from his medical director to us was, how should we get him back? These are sort of the answers that are out there. Did we tell him to continue and, and monitor his symptoms? Should we do further testing? What about just jump to the granddaddy of them all, a cardiac MRI? Or what about looking for blood work? So really any one of those are, are correct, or depending on where you are and what you've decided. But this is an example uh, of some of the folks at the professional level have gone down. Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell were the first domino to fall, it seems like, in American society in general. After Rudy Gobert's diagnosis, it seems like the world shut down. The Miami Marlins, multiple members of our local baseball team here in Miami, uh, shut down their team for several days. Um, Sidney Wiseman Mitchell and, and then multiple members of the Fiorentina soccer team also came down with coronavirus. And then Eduardo Rodriguez of the Boston Red Sox made headlines about two or three weeks ago when he was found to have uh, myocarditis or myocardial changes related to coronavirus. And he was put on the shelf and his season. But more recently, even this week, you've seen the headlines, I'm sure if you've been following it, the Power Five conferences are concerned about the heart conditions. Um, the, PAC, the, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 have shut down their college football seasons and are looking at other alternatives. So these are the headlines and this is what's out there and whether or not it, it, it's a reason to do it or if there are other causes um, remain to be seen or, or exactly what they're thinking of was. I mean, it's not about their reasoning today and it's been public. I've not had a chance to look at it. I think it's really important to understand all of this, to go back to basics, fundamentals. When we're talking about athletes, fundamentals are really important. So when we talk about COVID-19, first we're talking about the SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus. COVID-19 is the actual disease or the pandemic. You see the virus here, it's got these spike proteins which bind to the ACE2 receptor in our respiratory tract and then remains in our system. And this can cause a whole host of downstream effects, which are acute lung injury, 
um, heart effects, which I'll show you very shortly, vasoconstriction, blood vessels clamp down, or vascular permeability, which is this ARDS syndrome that, that perhaps you've heard about. So uh, really, unfortunately, this is a, a significant virus, which can cause significant symptoms in some folks. And you've undoubtedly heard about troponin in all of this, and you'll hear more of it in this presentation. But what is troponin? Troponin is a regulatory protein within the muscle of the heart. When it's bound by calcium after an action potential or an electrical wave throughout the heart muscle, it changes its shape to allow the muscle to contract. During significant injury or stress on the heart, this can be We see this in a variety of conditions. In the top left, there was research done after the Boston Marathon that showed just troponin can be detected in the blood based on running a marathon. And the worse trained you were, the more amateur of a runner you were, you were more likely to have troponin release. We see troponin releases in our stroke patients quite often. We know that in asymptomatic patients who have renal failure, who are on dialysis, if troponin is detectable, that the prognosis is worse and that they will be failure. And people who come into the hospital with heart rhythm disturbances and then troponin is measured, um, it, it leads to worse prognoses later on as well. So troponin in general, if it leaked into the blood, can be a sign of stress, but it can also be a poor prognostic sign. When we look at the myocardial changes of the heart, the cardiovascular changes that have been documented from coronavirus, really a whole host. In the yellow, we can see direct myocardial injury or direct injury to the muscle cells of the heart. Found necrosis or actual death and destruction related to hypoxemia or low blood, blood oxygen levels. And we've seen myocarditis as well, which can cause cardiogenic shock where the heart no longer meet the demands of the body. Uh, we see significant systemic inflammation from COVID-19 in this uh, entity called a stress cardiomyopathy. And that's not to say as well that the treatment for this disease can also lead to arrhythmias, especially in folks with long QT syndrome, and that the fevers can expose other underlying heart diseases like Brugada syndrome and, and render somebody in, in trouble due to an underlying disease that maybe they did or didn't. If we go further, the, the paper that made headlines and probably has led to a lot of what you've heard on the news is the one on the top, which is cardiac MRI in a select group of German patients. So this was about 100 patients. Dr. Yep. yep. Um, can, can we try switching to the a, a, a different audio? It, it seems as though there's there's some responses coming in that it's it's getting it's better now, but it is getting a little bit hard to hear and there's still some of the the audio fading in and out no problem let me see if i can get this going here Can you hear me okay now? Let's do it. Okay, you can hear me all right? Yes. Very good. Okay, so um, going back to this slide, let me go back one, and I apologize for the audio issues, but if we look at this MRI paper out of 100 German patients, um, this was a, a group of older patients who weren't necessarily athletes, and they found that in 78 out of those 100 patients, that there was still um, myocardial damage up to 60 some days later on. And again, not athletes and, and a whole host of patients, those who were hospitalized, those who were asymptomatic. So we do see that later on in the disease course that this can still present with, with heart damage. And if we actually look at autopsy data of uh, people who've unfortunately died from the disease, virus does make its way into the heart and causes myocarditis. So this is significant and it does cause us pause and it does cause us to think. And it does cause us to think about how we should triage our athletes and getting them back into sport after COVID illness. And th this was a paper that was put out by Dharma Phelan, uh, Jonathan Kim, and Eugene Chung, the Sports and Exercise Council with the American College of Cardiology. This was sort of the first flow chart that came out with how we should get our athletes back into sport afterward. Now, not necessarily talking about professional athletes, that, that's a different game and happy to this is amateur athletes, but people who are exercising at high levels. So this is how the flowchart that we are using currently to think about getting our athletes. 
This came from Jonathan Dresner and his group in terms of high school athletes. It's very similar to the one you just looked at, but again, we're talking about high school athletes here. And um, I think it's very important for those of us who are working on those levels with pediatricians, to be aware of these recommendations as well and have the discussions. And this was a paper I was fortunate enough to be part of, which we're awaiting publication on with Prashant Rao, Dr. Ben Levine, Eugene Chung, and Marshall Isaacs that, that we've put together with first responders who, as I mentioned, are going down with this disease. We were a little bit less restrictive with our algorithm here because we recognize the need for first responders out there taking care of the community and making our lives safe. So depending on which group you're working with, you can then pick the flowchart that makes the most sense to you. And what we're most concerned about is this entity called myocarditis or myocardial injury, scar, strain, inflammation on the heart related to a viral illness. This is a condition that we've known about for some time. This is not new. And we do have guidelines on how we get athletes back into play after myocarditis. And it, it essentially revolves around this. First of all, once an athlete has been diagnosed with myocarditis, it's three to six months with no activity. And then after that activity, after that period in time, we can then do an ECG, an echocardiogram, Holter monitor blood markers to see how their body has recovered from the illness. Some will repeat a cardiac MRI to see if that inflammation has, has receded, and then doing maximal exercise stress testing. This isn't just getting somebody on the treadmill and having a walk in the park, uh, but it is um, you know, pushing somebody to their limit as hard as they can. And so you know, this is the consideration. This is what we're all thinking about every single day when we're talking about Personally, what's my approach right now? It's really not much different than, than the way I think about pre-participation. That said, I try to dream big, but I think locally. So, you know, I try to do as much as possible and want to do as much as possible. But with the understanding that not every athletic group, every, every university, every high school that we're covering is the NFL or the NBA. So you can really only do what you can do and you want to try to make the most of what you have. And that involves discussions with the stakeholders, talking about what their goals are, what their resources is, and what the follow-up is. The, the last thing you really want to do is keep someone out of sport because they can't afford downstream testing. This disease has exposed the disparities that exist in our society as well, but I think it also has the potential to expose the disparities that exist with our ability to obtain testing needed. So we all just need to be thoughtful about this and also need to understand that no two athletes and no two sports are the same. So speaking with a colleague in the sports cardiology world the other day, he spoke about a punter versus a wide receiver. Well, that punter physiologically and how they act in a game is very different than the wide receiver. So again, having that discussion and really thinking thoroughly through with the stakeholders is going to be our So why does all of this matter? Why do we care about screening athletes? Why, why are we so concerned about COVID and myocarditis? It, it really comes down to sudden cardiac If you've experienced this, you know, especially in the sports setting, it's tragic highly visible, it's highly scrutinized, but it also is rare. This is not something that's happening every single day. It's important to understand that sudden cardiac arrest is different than sudden cardiac death. So um, sudden cardiac arrest is something that can happen for many reasons, as opposed to sudden cardiac death is usually precipitated by dangerous heart rhythm change, by changes in the heart rate, by sudden tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. And oftentimes this is labeled as a heart attack, which is not true. Heart just means that blood flow has ceased to the walls of the heart and that these dangerous rhythms persist from there. So that, that is something we're actively engaged in trying to change how we describe these certain things. But um, again, important to know the, the difference between these. And if you look at sport, just to illustrate why sudden cardiac death is different from sudden cardiac arrest, I show you these athletes here. So we're talking about Lewis from the Boston and died during practice. The bottom left is Steve Beckler, who was a pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles, who, if you're old enough like me to remember the Ephedra days, he was running poles during spring training in Florida in 1970 and uh, died suddenly due to illness. Patrick Akeng was a professional soccer player in Romania who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, collapsed on the field, um, was placed into a stretcher, was never had his pulse checked, um, was in an ambulance without a monitor, and finally got to the hospital and was found to be in a systole and was pronounced dead. And, if you're not familiar with his picture, you'll certainly be familiar with the name of Corey Stringer on the right, who the anniversary of his death just recently passed. And he's responsible, unfortunately, for all of the heat protocols and, and his namesake, the Corey Stringer Institute um, out of University. 
So uh, again, sudden cardiac death is rare, but it does happen. Uh, I show you this data just to give you the public health stance on where we're at. School children all the way up through the military, you do see an increasing trend. In the military, you'll note the large jump. So again, Dr. Francis O'Connor gave a wonderful talk and I encourage you all to look at it on the Dr. Francis page because it's worthwhile for anybody to understand. But a lot of the jump in military, number one is heat related illness, but also it, it is due to um, coronary artery disease as well, because we're dealing with older individuals at that point in time. But when you compare this to homicides and motor vehicle accidents, this does pale in comparison mostly to that. If you look at the causes of sudden cardiac, we, get, we sort of break this down into structural cardiac abnormalities, electrical cardiac abnormalities, and acquired. So the structural deal with the heart, muscle, and the valve. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is a condition seen more in the medical America, though certainly does happen. And then there can be malformations with how the heart artery lines form, and then Marfan syndrome, which can lead to diseases of like the aorta. Electrical cardiac abnormalities are things such as long QT syndrome, Wolf Parkinson White Bugatta syndrome, and then an entity seen more in children called catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Acquired cardiac abnormalities are things that we really have to think a lot of. So this can be infection, myocarditis, like we spoke about. Promodial cortis, which is a condition where the, the baseball, the, the hockey puck hits the catcher, or the hockey goalie right at the wrong timing in the chest and it leads to a dangerous heart rhythm. And then, of course, toxicity, performance enhancing drugs, illicit drugs, uh, things such as Red Bull, Monster, Four Loco, Five Hour Energy. Uh, we see a lot of this, unfortunately. So I encourage everyone to stay away from those. And then, certainly, hyperthermia, but as well as hypothermia, play a role in so Dr. O'Connor in his talk did allude to this data, but I just want to show up. From the University of Washington group, Dr. Dresner and Kim Harmon as well. Uh, the majority of athletes who die suddenly in college sports actually had this entity called sudden unexplained uh, death, which was they went to autopsy and could not find a reason exactly what happened. And I always hypothesize whether or not it's related to heat illness, perhaps an underlying electrical abnormality, or using some of these substances that I mentioned as well. But it is important to understand that this does happen and we're not able to explain why. But in their data, they were able to break it down by sport. And so when we talk about instituting a screening program, perhaps we look at these sports more at the top, men's basketball, men's soccer, men's football, men's swimming, men's cross country, as being the groups we want to screen. And you'll notice that I went through multiple groups of men's sports and not women. This really happens in men more than it does in women. And unfortunately, it happens more in black men than white men. So if we're targeting our screenings and we want to be as precise as possible, these are the groups that we look at more than others. Um, since we're on the concept of sudden cardiac death, it's important to know that you're going to see more of what are called implantable cardiac defibrillators in sport, especially competitive sports in the years to come. We're going to see more student athletes participating with this. And a lot of the data that's driving this comes from Rachel Lampert and Dr. Ray. And there's evidence that suggests that it may be safe to play with this. The athletes may get shocked from their device, and I'll show you. Some will get shocked for the right reasons, dangerous heart rhythms that could render the student athlete susceptible to sudden cardiac death. But some will have inappropriate shocks as well, where the device shocks the heart for regular heart rhythms or um, not, irreg not regular heart rhythms, but not rendering the athlete dangerous. So the, the wording in the guidelines, fortunately, has switched to say that we should all engage in shared decision making with this. Previously, if you had an ICD, you were restricted from sport entirely. But what we're finding is that we want people to exercise, we want people to be active, because that leads to decreased comorbidities, such as less and, less and high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. And this is what an ICD is. Currently, there are two flavors. One is called a transhuman, in which the device is just underneath the chest wall and wires thread into the heart. This wire right here that goes into the right ventricle will shock the heart with a dangerous heart rhythm. And this is called a subcutaneous ICD, which is the wire will go through the skin into the heart and shock the heart. And this is the data from Dr. Lampert. You see that there were shocks for ventricular tachycardia in the study that I mentioned at the beginning, both during competition and physical activity. But there were also shocks during competition and physical activity to these heart rhythms, which again were not rendering the athlete susceptible to sudden death. There were no device fractures, there were no malfunctions with the device. So it will happen. We will see more people exercise. We will see shocks as well. So sudden cardiac death is going to happen, unfortunately. Despite screenings, athletes 
high. And we, we know that from data out of London. And despite our best efforts, bad things are going to happen. So what can we do? Dr. Henning was kind enough to talk about the program that, that we developed in my previous employer and that we're looking forward to bringing to, to my newest employer as well. We, we created a program to train all the stakeholders, all of those people who care for athletes to make sure that they understand how to perform CPR, how to use an AED, and how to respond to sudden cardiac events in a sports setting. And we're really proud to partner with Nova Southeastern, training their coaches and student athletes. And the genesis for the program actually came from Florida Memorial University, where we, we found out that none of the coaches knew CPR. We found out none of the student athletes knew CPR. There was one defibrillator on campus. It was nowhere near their athletic facilities, and no one really knew how to use it. So we were fortunate enough to train everybody how to do CPR, how to use an AED, and one beat was coming. The program, uh, fortunately, is, is thriving, and we're very proud of it. So this is from that NCAA paper, which, which is, to me, another one of my favorite quotes. It's a debate about the effectiveness of various screening examinations and tools to prevent sudden cardiac death will undoubtedly continue. However, what we all know is that there's no debate that a well-rehearsed and effectively implemented emergency action treatment of cardiac death will reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. It just gets to the heart of that if we know CPR, if we know how to use an AED, we know how to recognize sudden cardiac arrest in the athletic setting, that we are going to save lives. If you can respond in two minutes or less to sudden cardiac death, the chances of survival are reduced. So what I encourage all of you to take back to your programs is number one, try to identify as best you can the risk of sudden cardiac arrest in your population, whether it's college athletes or athletes, maybe even occupational athletes. Are there regional referral centers where you can upload the information and get opinions? And, and we certainly are that at Baptist and want to work with all of you to help you keep your athletes healthy. Have you implemented and rehearsed your emergency action plan? So it's not good enough just to have it on paper and say you're ready to go. Just like sport, you need to practice this over and over again and make it muscle memory so that when you're in the bottom of the ninth and the bases are loaded and you have two outs, you're ready to rock and roll if somebody unfortunately suffers an event. And again, train all of your stakeholders, train your student athletes in CPR and AED use. So with that, I, I hope you got out of this that the, the cardiovascular care of a student athlete takes a team. And those of us who are sports cardiologists are really honored and, and want to be a part of it. Cardiovascular evaluations, the testing and the health problems of, of student athletes look different versus the general population. Screening is and will continue to be controversial. COVID has changed our game entirely, and I'm sure those of you who are on the front lines of this have seen it. But most importantly, have an emergency action plan, know, CPR, know how to use an AED. And, and like I said, teach your student athlete CPR because a lot of the times they're going to be your first response. So with that, again, I want to thank Dr. Kenny and her team. I apologize for all of the audio issues, and uh, I hope everyone is able to stay safe, and I look forward to All right, excellent. So we've got some questions coming in. Uh, the first one comes from Christina, and she asks, do you advise that we have high school students get an an EKG before returning to play if they have tested positive for COVID-19? If not, what's your perspective on what their protocol should be? Yeah. So it, it's, that's a great question. It, it's hard to make a blanket statement. So it, it, if we go back to that uh, article and, and that flow chart by Dr. Dresner, it does say to consider an ECG. But again, it's really important to know where you are, the population you're dealing with, and what your resources are. because. You know, the, the prevalence of this infection is probably far greater than what the numbers are. And, um, you want to make sure that if you are going to get an ECG, that the person who's going to interpret that ECG understands how to interpret an ECG in a student athlete, and then has the ability to get the testing that needs to take place thereafter efficiently and accurately. So what we never want is our athletes to sit out for a month or two months waiting on an echocardiogram or a cardiac MRI that would have come from that ECG if it's abnormal. So it's important to have a discussion with your medical directors, with your pediatricians, with your local pediatric cardiologists, and see if it's feasible. If it's not feasible and you think that the student athletes are going to be held out longer than they need to be, then perhaps it isn't worthwhile embarking on that program and just encouraging the student athletes to slowly increase their activity. And I emphasize slowly, and if he or she has any symptoms, then pulling the trigger to a cardiac evaluation. Certainly in our program, we do this, but we have the ability to guarantee the testing downstream. But again, we're having these discussions on a local level. We, we had it with a Division I college the other night. It, it is all very local to each institution, each cover. Um, 
And again, these need to be detailed discussions. Thank you. Uh, Sarah asks whether you think it's worth doing EKGs during PPEs in youth athletes, so ages 12 to 18, if they have a program that is available for free to all of the athletes. So yeah, um, again, uh, from, from the data that I showed you, ECGs can help, but they can also hurt too. So um, these free programs that are out there are these companies that, that will come in and offer their services. That, that's well and good. And everyone is very well intentioned. But again, if you get a flag abnormal, you need to make sure that the testing is available efficiently and accurately thereafter. And again, this gets back to that concept of exercise induced cardiac remodeling. So you, you want to make sure that you have all of your team in place so that you can quickly pass the ball off to your, your sports cardiologist, your pediatric cardiologist, who can work with his or her cardiovascular imagers and, and obtain the cardiac MR. So Again, it really does take a team. And if this is something that, that you're going to do, or if you're going to use one of these free programs, understand that for the vast majority of people, yes, they will be okay, but you will get abnormal results. And whether or not it's actually an abnormal ECG versus just being a normal ECG for an athlete, and then being able to get that testing is imperative. We, we never want to keep people out of sport unnecessarily. We see that very often where, where people are told your ECG is abnormal, your career is done. And then we meet them four years later and say, oh, you know, this probably is okay. So first of all, medicine do no harm. So you always want to make sure that you're not harming anybody in the process. All right. I have a question coming from Caitlin. And that's, is there a post-COVID cardiac questionnaire you recommend that the athletic trainers provide to athletes to review with their primary care physician after an athlete recovers from COVID? It's a great question. So there's not a questionnaire. I, I think with several of the colleges and universities we've worked with, we've developed our own questionnaire to send out to the student athletes um, so that as they're returning to campus right now, they're able to fill it out and, and give their athletic trainers and their, their primary care sports medicine physicians their information on where they've been at, whether or not they tested positive and what their symptoms are. So I don't think you can have a one size fits all policy there. What I think is really important is to emphasize a very slow recovery from this so that if somebody had the disease and now is recovering slowly, having chest pain, really having a difficult time with breathing that, that's disproportionate to the activity he or she is doing, if they're noticing that their heart is racing for no particular reason and they're just lying in bed, these are really concerning signs and symptoms to me. If you don't have the, the ability to work with a cardiologist or a sports cardiologist, I think, again, that really slow ramp up to activity is important in understanding and recognizing that if an athlete starts having symptoms when that happens, all bets are off and the athlete needs further testing at that point in time. And it's not just cardiovascular. We should also be doing pulmonary testing as well, you know, potentially looking for, for blood clots in the lungs, pulmonary emboli, because that's been described as well. All right. So this next question comes from Callie. She asks, is it necessary to have an additional rest period? for a college athlete who tested positive for COVID-19 has served their appropriate isolation period and then has a normal EKG or just do a progressive return to sport uh, protocol? And then is there a specific return to play protocol that you recommend? Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I think that if somebody has gone through the protocol, has a normal ECG and is feeling well, again, the slow ramp up back to activity is good as long as there are no symptoms. And working again with your athletic trainers, the athletic trainers, again, front line of this and, and really are, are the voice in the mind of the athlete and needing to recognize any issues that arise. So um, there's not a specific return to activity protocol that I have as a cardiologist. I think it's more the, the primary care sports medicine physician and the athletic trainers who are at the heart of that. Um, I think, again, want to emphasize that slow return to activity after it. So if you've gone through the protocol, the testing's normal, whatever that protocol may be locally, as long as there's no symptoms and things are, are going accordingly, um, then, then you're probably in good shape. But I, I think if symptoms arise again, that's where all bets are off and further testing is, is needed. Awesome. Okay, the next question well, comes from Stephen, and that's, has there been any evidence of cardiac pathologies from someone who has had a positive COVID-19 test and is asymptomatic? So if you look at that group from Germany, again, not athletes necessarily, 
but a, a portion of them were asymptomatic and, and they were found to have um, damage in the heart on that MRI. So, you know, whether or not these people are truly asymptomatic is difficult to say. It, it was not a large asymptomatic group in that study. Um, but again, we, we don't know 100%, but uh, I think we need to spend time talking to people. You know, this old tried and true method of the, the, the healthcare worker and patient relationship of really trying to find out if they were truly asymptomatic, especially when dealing with athletes. We know athletes will minimize things a lot of the time. So really spending time to talk to our athletes, go through what the symptoms could be, and then really, again, trying to develop that rapport with them. that They need to be honest with us, not only from the symptom standpoint, but also the public health standpoint. You don't want somebody coming in who's sick. You know, they, they, everyone needs to understand the greater good here. So the, the asymptomatic group is, is sort of the crux of all of this. And we don't have hard and fast data that MRI paper was the beginning of it. But again, spending time talking to our student athletes or our patients and counseling them and telling them what to look for is, is the heart of this. So there's uh, Melissa and Muriel both posed uh, two questions that I will, I'll, I'll read kind of through both of them. They're, they're very similar. What's the best way to find a sports cardiologist to work with? And, and she says, thank you for the shout out to performing artists and dancers. And Muriel asks a similar question in reference to the question regarding EKGs. Where is a resource for athletic trainers to find uh, these reliable specialists to interpret the results? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of it will start with people just like yourself, Dr. Henny, where, you know, working with your medical directors and, and your team physicians and understanding if they have relationships in the community and a lot of that work falls on people like yourself to, to sort of vet people like me of, you know, how comfortable are we with athletes? How much are we invested in this versus just doing this as a hobby? So I, I think, you know, it, it, you should feel free, even as a patient, let alone as somebody who's going to send an athlete to a physician to interview the people, your consultants, to understand, you know, exactly where they are, how up to date are they, how vested are they in the field? Um, so that's a very important thing, and it shouldn't be done on a whim. You, you really want to get to know who you're sending these folks to, because being on call for athletes is a 24-7, 365 job. It's not something that you take holidays from. You need to be ready to rock and roll, because again, keeping an athlete out of sport, especially at the higher levels you get to, uh, becomes increasingly important. So spend time, you know, go around the community, talk to the people that, that are around and healthcare workers and find out. Things you can look for, have they attended conferences? Are they a part of the ACC extra, sports and exercise section? Um, do they go to conferences? You know, what, what is their knowledge of this data? So the, the second part of that question, in that NCAA paper, there is a precedent for regional referral centers. And certainly we strive to be that at Baptist where I work now, of you know, getting folks there. And in this day, in, day and age of telehealth, you can upload data, you can send things via email and fax machines in HIPAA compliant fashion. So you know, personally, I can tell you it's my goal to be available to anybody who calls me regarding the student athlete. I can tell you with my colleagues in the field, those who have authored a lot of those papers that I've showed you, they want to be available. We're extremely passionate about this. A lot of us are athletes ourselves. And so we understand the importance of this. And we wake up in the morning, we're in, ready to go and take care of that. So, you know, if that means you, you talk to us at Baptist, you talk to Jonathan Kim at Emory, you talk to Aaron Baggish at, at Mass Gen or Ma Matthew Martinez, at, uh, in Morristown or Mike Embry at Cleveland Clinic, you know, we are happy and want to help. Nobody's going to hang up the phone with you. We, we want to be engaged and help. So pick up the phone, call us, and, and everybody's going to want to help. And uh, to the first point of all of that, yes, dancers, performance artists are absolutely 1 million percent athletes. And, and uh, we spend a great deal talking about that. You know, I can tell you all about uh, ballet uh, physicians and, and things of that nature that are a privilege of learning about. So yeah, athletes come in all shapes and sizes and form. It's not just uh, football players and basketball players. Awesome. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pull I'm gonna pull is a question regarding the and are you able to see my screen? There was a I question can, yes. the return to play progression. And this is the one that came from BJSM. Yes. I can make this picture any larger. Uh, I'm just gonna move this. Over. So that because John was asking about during the return to play progression, 
Um, it, and and he poses a good point here. Would you use a pulse oximeter? And then in this study, they also talk about the resting heart rate uh, as a uh, something to monitor. What is what is your perspective on using something like a pulse ox or resting heart rate during this return to play progression? How should how should the athletic trainers be kind of reviewing that data? So yeah, a lot of so the 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 caveat with all of this is they're recommendations and they are not guidelines. These these are not fact based because we just don't have the data yet to support any of this. So we've all tried to come together and say, this is what we think could be the way to do it, or this is what we think is the best way. And we're all actively engaged with one another, trying to put this data together and make sense of all of it. So um, pulse oxes are great. These GPS devices and um, other devices that people wear that, that can get you heart rate variability and the whoops and the garments, they're all wonderful. And, and they, they can give you data but the data is only as good as what you know what to do with it. So to me, or most people, so if we're talking about a high school in city or town X, I think symptoms are the hallmark. If somebody feels well, then I wouldn't go looking for trouble necessarily. Um, but if we're talking about the Miami Dolphins or the Miami Heat, then, you know, different story and different, different protocols there. But again, I think if we follow those initial protocols, like I showed you, the, the return to sport algorithms, I think we should be able to weed out any pathology. This is why I always emphasize emergency action planning and sudden cardiac death, because despite our best efforts, even in people who are perfect, things are going to happen. So, um, you know, this protocol is great. I did see it, um, but I don't know how useful or how able most people are going to be able to, or how uh, accessible it's going to be for a lot of people. Pulse oxes are great, but if somebody's fine, um, I don't know how much a pulse ox is going to happen. I, I would imagine any athlete who's, who's having pulse ox abnormalities is also going to be symptomatic. All right, at this point, it looks as though we've, we've made it through all of the questions. So thank you very much for that. Awesome. And just going to... Oh, there, here, here's one more. How do you feel about the efficacy of the new EKG technology, a live core, is it worth investing in and using this for the team PPE? So by a live core, I believe everyone's talking about the Cardia device, which is a device you can put two fingers on. So um, I do know of athletic trainers who have that. I, I view that more as an arrhythmia device than I do a screening ECG. So um, you know, these were just using fingers. This is not something that you can use to uh, pre do a, a screening ECG on. But if an athlete is having palpitations or things that could be an abnormal heart rhythm or an arrhythmia, this is a great point of care test. The athlete puts his or her fingers on there. Um, you can get a rhythm strip and I have tons of patients who send me them daily, weekly, et cetera, and we are able to take a look at it. So greater point of care for symptoms for an arrhythmia, not good for the PPE ECG to detect pathology. So, uh, yeah, but great question. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for just a, a plethora of information here. I know that everyone's going to um, love. There was already some people talking about downloading the, the PowerPoint handout. So I appreciate you, you being willing to share that. Um, it, would you like to, if you'd like, you can share your contact information. Um, but thank you very much for, for a great talk. Absolutely. I, I'll send you my contact information and you can get it out to the group, presumably via email, and, and we can go that way. And, and people should, you know, like I said, those of us who do this really want to be helpful to anybody, whether it's in Alaska or right next door. So anybody should always feel free to get in contact. The last thing we want is for an athlete to have a problem. So um, always feel free to contact us no matter what. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your time. And uh, we'll see you again at the next one. Thank you so much.